Section 7. The Battle for the Birds, Part 3. Chapter 14 The Method and the Moment. The sounds of heavy equipment being reassigned that flew up from downstairs began to sound more frequent. For many days in a row there would be no change and then, suddenly, there would follow a huge surge of activity which would change the whole game. Terry was living a separate story. On some mornings his head was full of stars and he was unable to cope but, at other times, he was finding a voice in his playing. He kept saying to himself to stay on track and remain determined, whilst the world around him changed. The music developed a strength of character and, gradually, Terry's education crept back into place so that, by mid-February, he had regained his confidence on work days. His health was improving. Once there had been no safe place to sleep and now a final goal was achievable. He was back to unwinding with the familiar strong coffee and incense and he measured up his life by how he felt in those safe moments. Evidence of struggle was all around him. The continual additions had built up a multitude of irregular patterns of lines, grids, and triangles that traced across the walls, making the flat look like a badly wrapped birthday present. The flat system of interlocking strands of materials throbbed like a spider's heart. The horse's plans were obscene. The waves were shaped like funnel webs that seemed to curve the energies into their hungry mouths. His skin was being stung every day, but he was still confident in his body's abilities to ward off the damaging waves and Terry kept a sense of perspective. Terry spent one Tuesday at home. The birds stayed extra close all day and the seagulls made their regular military-like assessments. He could hear the distant swarming of the crows up at the green and a single crow chuff punctuated the morning at the most random of moments. The sounds were a constant reminder that the forest was near. Predictably, at 10 o'clock am, the skeletal bird flew past the studio as if it were the fount of all knowledge. Two pigeons were followed on to trace an arc in just two flaps. Terry had dismissed the idea that the birds were showing off until the parrots coursed through the block like joyful skateboarders. They had not lost their faith. They cut through the air like steel. Then the adhesive Faraday paper arrived and more confrontations could begin. With a reel of copper tape in his hand, Terry was sat, bolt still, preparing to follow his deductions. During the early hours, Strips of the stuff had already been taped into position around the whole toilet window alcove and across the room ceiling near to the door. This had been followed up with copper taping together the two hallway walls by going across the ceiling, near to the light. As soon as this had been done, the meter on the small table next to the bed had fallen to such an extent that it confirmed to Terry that the devices were connected and he had slept for a while imagining that it was essential for the mask to contact all the devices in order to make the abnormal construction function. Now, a long strip of copper tape was put up to join the front and back lounge walls. Lines were put onto the wall above the serving hatch, linking the whole area together and this exhausted the reel. Terry felt the flat suddenly gain a new glint of hope and, like the sunlight that was flashing through the bare branches outside, everything looked more colorful and less uninviting. The signals dropped off in other areas too and Terry lay back on the bed to let the amendment settle in. The doubts in his mind lessened in number and problems flew away like jays, never to return. He knew that there must be a cutting point and the slightest of changes could bring down the most drastic of problems. Perhaps the papered bedroom wall was providing the earthing on the opposite side of the flat to the toilet and it was drawing the radiation from the hallway. What was certain was that most of his contraptions worked. The paper was remarkable and it absorbed much of the signal. The hernia on Terry's groin was reducing in size, even though his veins felt like they had been cooked. He let go and his body twitched and contorted as it tried to heal. The next day at 11 o'clock am, the huge voltage surges which were designed to magnify and locate any slight object of interest in Terry's home, rose so high that he could do nothing but feel glued to the spot. He had thought that he had the horse on the run but now he wasn't so sure. The bird calls began to sound distant and chaotic once more. Were they mocking his place in the world? The situation was without solution. When a three was heard in the distance, Terry understood that another flat situation was being noted. He lay down in his safe space to allowing the rising tensions to release themselves from his body. 
Once his mind had found the right frequency, his reflexes started to do their business. He rubbed his back and it felt more fleshy. The day-to-day -day environment was changing. Perhaps, thought Terry, he was just one stepping stone away from regaining his old perceptions. As the Faraday paper was stuck up into the corners of the lounge, he predicted the alterations in the meter readings on the other side of the flat and he was right. Time was mending as his future and past were zooming toward him. The emotions that this process drew out of him were out of control. Sometimes, he was waking up, still wondering who he was to become that day. His diary was full of things that were not important to him but he repeated in his mind, like a mantra, how pathetically selfish these people were and he kept his nerve, even if every day was filled with the sounds of scratching from below. The unsettling changing magnetisms did not stop at night but he tried to reuse his bed to sleep in. It had a less than comfortable feel but, even so, his body felt more refreshed after sleeping. This made him question the safety of his safe area. He needed to check and at once found cross currents under the carpet that ran in diagonals. This was concerning. Back to the bedroom. Terry had the old light fitment from the kitchen in his hand. He had taken it from inside the hallway alcove's lower box and he put it under the bedside cabinet to join with the plasterboard connector. This affected the sideways sweeping signals. On the morning of the 9th of March, the voltage backdrop in the air was running between 1 and 5 volts per meter throughout the whole flat. Terry was in the kitchen trying to figure out what to do with the water and gas mains piping and casing in the corner. It contained the two earth wires from the A and B circuits. The signals still traveled down and away from it so his next move was to tape a large section of newly arrived Chinese fabric to the ceiling and around the top of the casing which WA joined to a rectangle of radiator preserver. The lower part of the tiled kitchen wall which faced the mast was given more taping. This time it ran in a zigzag directly above the work surface and onto the plastered wall beneath the boiler. Whatever was scoping his property was able to find a weakness in the line within seconds. Then the heavy aluminium plate was taken up from just inside the front door and placed on the top of the kitchen cabinet to sit as close as possible to the pipe casing. The signals through the window suddenly dropped off. Copper tape was taken away from the lounge wall and used to connect the long aluminium runner strip that followed the join between the wall and the ceiling. The arrangement was linked in. This was the highest access point that Terry could deal with and, since his plan was to work his way from the front door toward the mast, he had deliberately left this part of the flat to manage later. It was a devious strategy to gradually make his problem invisible to whatever he was dealing with. Terry worked on his music until 3.30 p.m. The silhouette of two birds flashed like butterflies across the middle of the studio blinds. He stopped playing to sit on the window sill and look down at the channel road. The downstairs and the next door signalers were still attempting to pierce their way through the bedroom walls with their voltage-driven rapiers. What or who would decide the next problem? A magpie was sat on the roof of the other block, looking over at Terry like a judge. In the evening hits of 0.6T began and the microwaves clouded his ears. It was heavy and the situation inevitably led to a session of fritted work and a headache. The sheets in the lower kitchen corner were ruffled up into more layers and some of the adhesive Faraday paper was cut away from the lounge ceiling corner to be added to the kitchen ceiling above the pipes but this time, nearer to the window. He accomplished the adjustments almost unconsciously since he had decided to keep his mind purely upon his music for the next few hours. Each change only took minutes out of his playing time and the next steps forward might take a while to become clear to him. His priorities were clear. Sometimes, he would only allow 10 minutes of the day to be spent on ridding himself of some new stunt or he simply followed his finely tuned instinct to shore up another leak. Sometimes his mind was not his own in his composing and his prophetic fixing. An aluminium strap was taken from under the studio radiator and wedged in to connect the pipes above the boiler. One was unreasonably off the scale in its radiation, despite the whole circuit being shut off from the fuse box. He covered the join between the ceiling and wall with Faraday paper. The left side doorpost of the lounge was fully taped down head to toe and freshly stripped aluminium was stuffed under each post. He was concluding that the door frames, 
despite their tape and paint were acting as transmitters of the signal across the flat. More aluminium was shoved under the skirting near to the bedroom door. This wall to the side of the bed was incredibly difficult to deal with as the beams shot across from the corner at so many different angles hugging the wall as closely as they could without compromise. Every corner was trying to hit the central ceiling light and the transmitter at the foot of the bed was running through his feet as the microwaves traversed the room to the far upper window corner. He took up much of the carpet nearest to the door. On inspection, the signals were running through the smallest of gaps around the section of metal bath mat that lay on the floor near to the door in that corner. He pushed the heavy section closer into the wall corner and layered on top two aluminium sheets, poster liner, and RF reflective strips that covered the gaps. Nothing could be left to chance. At night, the robin returned. It was all just a story. Terry threw some food out of the lounge window to the channel road. He knew how the bird's constant encouraging flights up to the window was lighting up his day. The next day, Terry was sat at the keyboard not knowing what to expect. He watched the show from the meter on the music stand. The highs that ran into the flat through the chase wall were lifted well into the danger area. 0.7 T and further before the predictable run around and a drop to 0.25 T as if trying to find a match. Let me in. No. Let me in. No. The crows seemed to laugh in the distance. Then a crow lifted itself up to Terry's roof. It had foreseen the arrival of two magpies that fluttered through the channel as if they were made of balsa wood. The meter fell one more time which encouraged a pigeon to cut up to the guttering where the crow had sat a day. Terry watched as its tail moved clumsily down the side of his roof. This all looked like natural play. Soon a crow was marching back and forth on the opposite roof in full ownership. It stopped to look over and bowed in a jerk before flying up to the green. Terry felt vindicated. The next morning two magpies were waiting for him on the channel block's roof. They had enjoyed the bright sunshine for a good hour before Terry appeared and were using the vantage point to look over the operations of the village. The next day, the same birds returned to cover the same duties. They had their routines. By the time that the crow moon arrived, Terry was making plans for the future. A polystyrene aluminium strip was stuck all the way along the side studio wall where his desk had formerly sat a day. Now he knew that the searching beams were able, in an instant, to find the next angle unless he fooled the cameras away. A triangle of tape was fixed over the top. His aim was to confuse and absorb but, in the back of his mind, his major worry was that a complete protection would be the only option. The wall to the side of the radiator already had been painted and tapes of all kinds were upon it. What more would it take? Every signal was strong and flooded into the room at all sorts of trajectories. Surely, they were being led down to the radiator. The alcove was taped up and preserver attached to it but this was just not enough and the venomous streams crept back in. Terry, however, consoled himself with the fact that the major disciplinary work had been done. He altered the old carpet runner, the adapters that sat on the lower radiator arm and stripped and joined until he was happy. Now the two magpies were cavorting around. They knew that a change was in store. The studio radiator was further connected to the wall under the sill and a large square of Faraday paper was added to the small wall to its left and he used the meter to again pick up the transverse waves that were hitting down on the sill. He was drawing the current down so that it would flow into the lower radiator arm pipe. He rounded the move off with the tassima being switched on in the oven socket. He matched every move with a filter change. Later that day, Terry felt the need to carry on with the kitchen additions. He taped onto the areas where he found that the signals were still shooting up to the tiled casing side of the cluster of pipes and a clump of materials, including the sticky plastic EMF absorbing material was stuck to the plywood casing near to the ceiling and out to wall, absorbing yet more of the terrifying signal.